everyone and welcome to Blameless Pages. Today we're talking about Act 3 of the importance of being earnest. Please make sure that you've seen my part 1 and part 2 videos just to make sure you're up to date and let's continue right away. So we left off with Gwendolyn and Cecily discovering that they have been deceived by Aldrin and Jack and they storm off leaving Jack and Aldrin to stress eat muffins. Act 3 opens with the morning room at the manor house and Gwendolyn and Cecily are eager to have a romantic scene that was popular in fiction of the time where the men get down on one knee and they apologize and they're willing to do anything to repent and make sure that the women are forgiving them. Gwendolyn remarks that they have some sense of shame left because Jack and Aldrin are not approaching them. Cecily and Gwendolyn appear to want it to be that way where they don't approach them and they like work up to it but the men don't seem to be doing just that and so they're eager to see signs where they aren't any. For example, Cecily says they're eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They just don't want to admit that the men don't seem in any way concerned that they have deceived the women or that they hurt them. They're just out there enjoying themselves just like any other day, whereas they want this big scene of apology. They feel hurt that the men don't take into account that they have deceived the women and that their feelings have been hurt, and so Gwendolyn asks Cecily to cough. Cecily says, well, I can't cough. I haven't got a cough. And then uh, the men begin to approach them just then, and Gwendolyn quickly changes her behavior and says, what effrontery, like, how dare they approach us? They decide to preserve a dignified silence, and Jack and Aldrin approach them while whistling a ridiculous tune from a British popular air of the opera at the time. And here we see another jab at society and popular culture, because as talked about in the previous scenes, Wilde didn't feel as if he had a place in society, probably because of his flamboyant behavior and homosexual tendencies. Victorian society with its stiff and proper and moral ideas just wasn't willing to accept him, even though he was a popular writer and famous at the time. So he's jabbing at the idea that art can bring about change, whereas the Victorian society is no longer willing to accept change or accept art that doesn't conform to their ideals. So he's arguing that, well, how, how can you claim that art can bring change if you don't want to appreciate that art and if you don't want to accept me? Gwendolyn says they will not be the first to speak and Cecily agrees. And as soon as Cecily agrees and the men come in, Gwendolyn straight away goes into interrogation, which uh, kind of fits in well with the idea that she wants to develop in all direction because uh, what she wants to do and how she wants to behave because she thinks that she ought to behave So like a proper woman she should sit there like this and just wait for their apology But instead she wants answers and she wants to be the first to take control of the situation Gwendolyn uh, fight between what she thinks she want, what she thinks she should do and what she actually wants to do and I think it's very in line with the idea of the new woman as we talked about before so Gwendolyn just doesn't want to be this classic woman who sits back and lets women do all uh, lets men do all the work. She wants to take control. And w w Virginia Woolf has a brilliant essay on this topic called "Healing the Angel in the House," where every time she wants to write, she has this thought of like, "Oh, the angel in the house would be married by now, or have children by now, or mm, the angel in the house would let the man do the writing." And so she talks about the importance of killing that like that voice that society whispers in her ear off and I think Gwendolyn does that quite well because Gwendolyn previously mentioned that she wants to develop in all directions so that's what she's doing whereas Cecily Cecily is the ingenue she's content to just follow the lead and she treats Gwendolyn quite like a sibling like they oh she agrees with her and then she she doesn't agree with her like it's this petty teasing and kind of bothering each other but when it comes down to the important situations they agree and I think this is part of the irony that they treat each other like siblings much like Jack and Aldrin and treat each other like brothers even though they don't want to behave that way and they only call each other sisters after they have insulted each other in a myriad of ways in act two. Aldrin then explains that he only pretended to be earnest so that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. Cecily says questioningly to Gwendolyn like, mmm, what a wonderful explanation. And even though I don't believe it, I think it sounds quite beautiful. And with that, Gwendolyn agrees, saying that in matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. We as the audience are of course skeptical of Aldrin and then Jack uh, claiming that they did all their bunburying because they loved the women and they just wanted to meet them. No, rather they were escaping for their own pleasure and for their own amusement. They tell the women exactly what they want to hear. And I think there's a wider commentary here about Gwendolyn and Cecily being quite 
eager and willing to accept it because marriage at the time was very much superficial as Wilde continuously points out and mocks the idea of it in the upper classes because it was very much a financial proposition and so they they hear what they want to hear merely because they don't want to be in the situation where their engagement is broken off. Marriage at the time was very much about compromise and thinking well as long as nobody else knows that he's cheating on me or that he's doing whatever I am very much fine with it because as a woman you really had no place to go like once you were married that's it you can't just go off bunburying because it's not appropriate in the eyes of society so this is why it's the style that's important everyone knows it's not true everyone knows it's not sincere it's a false romantic ideal nothing more but both parties are willing to accept it for the purpose of the smooth running of society and the and appearing to be perfect in everybody else's eyes. Likewise, the men are very willing to accept Gwendolyn and Cecily's aesthetic ideals, no matter how superficial it is. And of course, it's a lesser sacrifice, but it's still a sacrifice nonetheless, because Gwendolyn and Cecily have an intense commitment to marrying someone named Ernest. It was their girlish dreams that they want to see fulfilled. And so Algernon and Jack are willing to go ahead with the with the proposal and changing their names and when Gwendolyn and Cecily says like fine you're forgiven for the deception but there's an insuperable barrier you're not named Ernest Algernon and Jack quickly say that well we're going to get christened this afternoon so it's all fine and when they hear that Jack and Algernon are to be christened they hug them and say that physical courage and what self-sacrifice like how impressive this is and Gwendolyn further remarks how absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned men are infinitely beyond us the joke of course is that the men are simply trying to move on from the fact that they deceived them and to distract them with a very trivial sacrifice Algernon and Jack are merely doing it to account for their self-serving and egotistical nature and the irony is that they're becoming more like their alter egos more like Ernest so even though they're being called earnest now, they're far from being earnest, so they're dishonest. So it's a very careful play on words again, and Wilde's careful construction of comedy is honestly just a delight to unpick. They fall into each other's arms happily, and then Merriman, cough cough, assesses the situation and kind of warns them because Lady Bracno is here. She arrives explaining to Jack that she bought the confidence of Gwendolyn's trusty maid with the help of a small coin. Again, <laughs> dramatic irony, so she's only trusty to other people she's willing to absolutely sell out for the pro for the prospect of a coin and again this is kind of a response to Algernon's comment in the first act that the lower classes are supposed to set an example so while the upper classes get to be decadent and enjoy whatever depravity they want to think of it's the lower classes who have to constantly work, who have to set this ideal of like the perfect person. And here, uh, Wilde quickly shows that actually the lower classes are pretty concerned with trying to survive while you have fun and enjoy whatever it is you're enjoying, which is quite often doing nothing as also remarked in the first act. Lady Bracknell tells Gwendolyn to sit down without hesitation because hesitation is a sign of mental decay in the young and physical weakness in the old. The irony again here is that she tells Gwendolyn to stop hesitating so she shouldn't like think through every decision she should just go ahead and act and that's exactly what Gwendolyn did by coming to Jack's country estate and now Lady Bracknell is mad at her. <laughs> that Gwendolyn's father is under the impression that Gwendolyn is attending a lecture on the influence of permanent thought on the influence of permanent income on thought and she never undeceived him on any question before meaning that she's very content to just leave her husband in the dark and take control of the situation because she is the one in control of their household she is the woman wielding power lady bracknell does not in the least care if jack and gwendolyn believe that they are engaged she merely says you are nothing of the kind and turns her attention to Algernon. she then asks him if this is the house of bunbury and Algernon quickly remarks what oh Bunbury oh right right uh I killed him off this afternoon oh wait wait sorry he died this afternoon his aunt Augusta is of course very terribly confused like how is it that he died the natural question and Algernon just reminds that oh well the doctors told him that he can't live anymore and so Bunbury went ahead and died and Lady Bracknell merely remarks that hmm kind of strange that he has 
that he holds the opinion of his doctors in such high esteem, but good for him for decided to either for having decided to either live or die in any case. And there's been a theory before that Lady Bracknell actually knew all along that Algernon was making Bunbury up, but she was content to let him enjoy himself and sort of escape the expectations of society because he's a man, whereas for Gwendolyn she was not so willing. Uh, this theory, I believe, does have some potential merit because Lady Bracknell is quite all-knowing, she understands very well what to do in these situations. However, potentially, I don't think she knew. Maybe she suspected, but there wasn't any concrete evidence to prove so. And she then turns her attention to Cecily because Cecily is holding Algernon's hand and says, who is this young lady? I trust Miss Cardew is not at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London. So of course, a dig at Jack's claims that he came from Victoria Station, not like a terminal, right? And then there begins another mock interview. Except for this time, Jack is answering not for himself, but for Cecily. He says that Cecily is the granddaughter of Mr. Cardew. He talks about her dresses and her family solicitors being Margby, Margby, and Margby. He also says that he has certificates of her birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and German and English measles. He actually seems very responsible as a guardian, so this fits in with Prism's idea of him earlier, how he is very much prim and proper when it comes to Cecily. He does indeed take responsibility. And now we see why he felt so pressured to escape into the town. And also, I just like to point out that it says that Cecily has certificates of a whooping cough, whereas before she said she has no such cough. So I don't know who produced those certificates, but clearly something that doesn't add up here. Lady Bracknell remarks that this is a life crowded with incident, but she's not a fan of premature experiences. Ahem, read between the lines, all those engagements you young people are pulling off without me, I don't like it. An engagement is something that should be thrust upon a young girl. It's not something that should, she should be able to arrange for herself, as said in Act 1. She is just about to head to the station with Gwendolyn dragging her along when, as a matter of form, she remembers to ask if Cecily has any money, and Jack says, goodbye, nice to have met you. I mean, of course, this is sarcasm, he isn't happy to have seen her at all, and says, well, she has £130,000 in the fund, because he knows perfectly well that Lady Bracknell will turn around, because £130,000, it's a lot now. At the time, it was even more. Suddenly, Cecily appears as a very beautiful young girl with solid qualities and distinct social possibilities in her profile. And she also says, we live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Cecily's relations are not super aristocratic, but she is wealthy, and that's enough for Lady Bracknell, who is just trying to arrange a marriage for the sake of money. And she reminds that she's not usually a fan of those marriages, even though she was actually that exact marriage, so she married into wealth herself. And she also says that she's not a fan of long engagements because they give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. So once you're married, you're done. So she quickly wants to marry Cecily off to Algernon, thinking about the possibilities that she will bring. The social possibilities in her profile, meaning that having Cecily would increase Lady Bracknell's standing and her Alger and Algernon's standing, so their, in their position in society. So no matter what she thinks of Jack, no matter what she thinks of Cecily, how much she likes her, she's wealthy and that's all that matters. Jack challenges her authority by questioning Algernon's character. He says, mm, it's very well that you like Cecily, but you can't just marry her off to Algernon. I don't agree because Algernon is dishonest. And he then proceeds to list all of the crimes that Algernon has committed, like drinking eight bottles on a pint, drinking the best champagne in Jack's house, coming to Cecil Cecily as another person and seducing her. All of the crimes are revealed and Lady Bracknell is really flustered and she goes, mm -hmm, well, like, you know, I'm willing to overlook it. And Jack says, but I'm not because Cecily only comes of age when she's 35 because <laughs> for a Victorian society, women are apparently only able to make rational decisions when they're in their middle age. So uh, he uses Algernon and Cecily to leverage his own position with Gwendolyn. Lady Bracknell, however, is adamant and she does not want Jack marrying marrying Gwendolyn because she has high hopes for her and to that uh, Jack says that it's a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. Lady remarks that that's not her plan for Gwendolyn but Algernon of course can do whatever he wants, again Wilde highlights the inequality of the sexes. Chasuble walks in and says he's ready for them to be baptized but Lady Bracknell absolutely forbids it and Chasuble says that in that case he will return to Miss Prism who's waiting for him and at that point 
Lady Bracknell suddenly starts. She sends for Prism and now we're about to very dramatically see why Bracknell despises her. And not only because she doesn't believe in the theory of modern education. Prism, she shouts, where is that baby? And Algernon and Jack like shield uh, Cecily and Gwendolyn from the from the public scandal, showing Victorian attitudes of the time that a public scandal is something to be embarrassed of, however, it's also something to be listened in and enjoyed. Where is that baby prism? It is then revealed that actually Miss Prism went out of the house 28 years ago with a pram and with a baby, but she was so airy and head in the clouds that she left the baby <laughs> and she, she, left the, she left the manuscript and she left the baby and the pram was later found with the manuscript and the handbag with the baby was never found. And this upends the idea of Miss Prism as the picture of responsibility and integrity and well, <laughs> it very much offends Algernon's idea of the lower classes holding the pillars of society because Prism's pristine reputation crumbles. She isn't this perfect person with moral proclamations that she says she is to Cecily. Actually, all members of society are flawed and we all just care about our reputation, according to Wilde. She chides Cecily for being head in the clouds, but she herself was once like that. Jack immediately pieces the story together and rushes to find the handbag. He gives it to Miss Prism like, Miss Prism, this is, is this the handbag? It's so important. And Miss Prism is overjoyed to have it back. She's delighted. She begins inspecting the handbag and she doesn't remotely care that Jack is the baby. He has to actually tell her, I'm the baby. You found more than the handbag. Mother, he's overjoyed to see her. But Miss Prism is scandalized like, mother, of course I'm not your mother. I'm unmarried. Jack launches into a monologue. Unmarried? I do not deny that this is a serious blow, but after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Wilde makes a pointed statement about inequality once again and also portrays Jack as being embraced being progressive and embracing the idea of the fallen woman. Lady Bracknell at this point intervenes, calmly explaining that Jack is actually the son of her sister, the deceased Miss Moncrief, and that makes him Algernon's older brother and Gwendolyn's first cousin. And Jack is overjoyed because the issue of relations has been resolved. Never mind that they're cousins, um, um, sweet home Alabama. But he wants to know next what is his true name, because of course if he was a baby who had all the riches and the attention bestowed upon him, then he must have been christened. He rushes to the bookshelves to find the army list and to look through the ghastly names for General Moncrief, who died while serving honorably in the army. He looks through those lists and he looks through those lists and the absurdity of looking through these ghastly names of course shows the absurdity of Victorian society valuing names and reputations so much. And he finds General Moncrief only to realize that his name is Ernest John. So he wasn't lying all along, his name actually is Ernest and he does indeed have a brother, Algernon. He then apologizes to Quentin like, oh sorry, I was telling the truth the whole time. Again, comedy, because you would think that he would more apologize for the deception, but that never happens. Again, the Felix Culpa, the fortune and fall, everything is forgiven, every sin absolved. And he then proclaims that he now understands the vital importance of being earnest. And I think it's important to remark that the art of his deception actually became truth. So fiction and art became life. So art is life and life is art. So Wild, uh, Wild ends with that prominent and powerful statement. And with that, I really hope you enjoyed this video. It was a shorter act because less went on and I hope this entire series helped. So thank you so much for watching and thank you for being here and I'll see you soon.